Good morning. It's about uh, 1020 in the morning here in Zhongshan, China. Uh, happy Mid-Autumn Festival to everybody. Everyone here has the, the day off. It is a holiday. Uh, last night or yesterday was also a holiday for many people. Um, most people had to work on Saturday, but uh, they got the rest of the weekend off. And uh, people have been enjoying a lot of very festive atmosphere out here down below the studio here. There's like some street vendors and some uh, some shows and everything. I see a lot of that. But uh, I just got back from a road trip. So I wanted to share with all of you the uh, incredible week I had. I've been gone for over a week now. And I got back late last night. And my car got fixed. Yay. All right. My car got fixed. It cost more money than I thought it would, but you know, I'm happy that it got done. <laughs> so uh, I will uh, start off with uh, where I've been. Um, Mona and I took a little road trip. We left Thursday and we went out to eastern Guangdong to Shantou and Nan Nanao Island, which uh, was kind of disappointing. There, there are beautiful beaches on the island there, but uh, the tourist infrastructure there was a little lacking, I thought. Uh, we actually didn't stay on the island. We stayed in Shantou <clears throat> at a couple of places. Uh, so let me share with you some photos uh, and, uh, so you guys have some understanding of what I'm talking about here. Uh, okay. Where's, no, no, that's not it. That's not the right one. Nope. <laughs> I am very disorganized, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, okay, well, driving out there, uh, was a giant rainstorm. I mean, I have never been in a rainstorm like this in my life. The The rain was so thick that uh, I had to pull off the side of the road. Literally, people were stopped on the highway. I couldn't see in front of me, and I was so nervous someone was going to run into the back of me that I just had to pull off the side of the road. And <clears throat> that was a little, little scary. And I was riding in this. This is the rental car that I had. It's a, uh, it's a Volkswagen La Vida. And I got to say that uh, this has got to be China's best-selling, most boring car. <laughs> it's just a very boring car. It's slow. I mean, it's comfortable enough. Um, it felt safe in it. I felt, you know, like it was well-built and all. But it didn't have any amenities whatsoever. You know, it had... Um, it had Apple CarPlay. <laughs> uh, it didn't even have a backup camera. So this thing was... Um, our chariot for our road trip. Pretty competent little car. Won't won't lie, but man, it's slow. Comparing it to uh, Mona's uh, Toyota Corolla, uh, I take the Corolla every day. I mean, it, the Corolla has so much more technology, has leather seats. Just they're about the same price, but uh, yeah, this thing just didn't have anything in. It. <laughs> That's all right. All right. Uh, Boy, I got a lot of photos, and I'm very, I'm a lot more, I'm a lot more disorganized than I thought. Before we left from the trip, we stopped by Sam's Club. Now, I had never been to Sam's Club in China. And if you don't know, Sam's Club is like the a Costco, but I think it's owned by Walmart. And there's one in Huizhou, and we we stopped by. This is a beautiful Sam's Club. It's brand new, and uh, it was really cool, actually. <laughs> uh, I haven't been to a Costco or a Sam's Club in years. And so walking into that that warehouse setting again was uh, wonderful. It was it was great to uh, to see that again. And of course, the meats. These are some of the best cuts of meat I have seen in a store in China. The prices were great. We didn't buy any because there was just too much. It was just me and her. We were looking for like small cuts that we could like barbecue that night. But I I'm very impressed with Walmart or with uh, Sam's Club. And they had other things for like hot pot and things like that. It was pretty cool. But the real thing that got me was this. Who didn't love getting an all beef hot dog and a soda for 12 RMB? Yeah, that's less than two dollars. I mean, we used to go to Costco and to Sam's Club just to get the hot dog and the soda. So I was like a kid again when I saw this. And it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, we're getting that. Yeah, forget everything else. We're just gonna get a hot dog and a soda. I'm going to put some mustard and relish. I'm going to freaking inhale this thing. And I did. And it tastes just like back home. It was great to have <laughs> a hot dog. Of all the things, I'm not even much of a hot dog guy, to be honest. But 
that was uh there was a, a sense of nostalgia from my days uh, i even going to a, a baseball game getting a hot dog and a beer excuse me yes <clears throat> i am drinking mccafe latte this morning because you know mcdonald's mccafe does a pretty good job i think i usually don't stream in the mornings but uh, i woke up this morning and uh had to get this in before I start my day. I'm not doing anything today. I, I have like cleaning to do and do some editing for some vlogs because I got a lot of vlogs coming up. Speaking of uh, that, check this out. Oh, no, we'll do that later. We'll do that in a second. Okay, so going back, um, the reason why we had the rental car was because my car was getting fixed. You can see here, this is a busted. Had to get that replaced. To get this replaced, timing chain, everything. This is what the engine looks like now. Yes, that is a Mitsubishi engine in my Chinese SUV. Uh, these years, this was a, a mine's a 2011. Oh, excuse me, mine's a 2012. And uh, the first couple of years of the H6 had Mitsubishi uh, 1.5 liter uh, four cylinders in it. So that's one of the reasons why I bought it. I wanted the Mitsubishi engine. Anyways, it was time for a timing belt. It's got 140,000 kilometers on it, so time for the timing belt change. It was a scheduled maintenance thing, and uh, of course, I redid the uh, all the hoses and the radiator hoses and the air and the air hoses. Um, uh, got a lot of things replaced on it, and uh, the whole thing took about 10 days for them to do it, and it cost me 3,600 RMB. So, what is that? Less than 500 dollars for all of it and um the car I picked it up yesterday and oh well not actually it was less than that it was like 3100 rmb because i had uh, some paint work they fixed some scratches on the on the car itself so uh, it cost a lot less than that not bad so i've extended the life of my used uh second hand car it's now uh just about 10 years old and i had plans to replace it later this uh, or next year around spring festival but now that i've spent this money and i've got the engine pretty much rebuilt i might as well just keep the car right uh, yeah susan mooncake festival i i am actually not a big fan of mooncake <laughs> i um i growing up a lot of my chinese friends in in uh, southern california would gift me mooncake this time of year and so i i was aware of mooncakes and some of them are really good so especially the sweet ones i really like the sweet ones but uh there's just so much of it and this year i got so many gifts of mooncake there's no way i can eat all of this i mean i can have like one bite and i'm done they're they're very very filling they're very high in calories so it's it's difficult to consume that much mooncake when everyone's giving it's like fruit cake during the holidays you know everyone gives a fruit cake and it's like uh, how much fruit cake can you eat <laughs> But the, the country is celebrating. We are on a holiday today, um, and uh, it's a beautiful day in Zhongshan. So uh, I got the window closed, but uh, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, lovely view out there. Okay. Let's give you some more about the road trip. This is Mona and I. We're in Old Town Chanteau. Um, if you don't know, Chanteau is it's uh, it's one of three cities that make up the area known as Chaoshan. Uh, the three cities are Chanteau, uh, Chaozhou, and uh, Jiayang. And I've been to all three, and I've done videos on on especially Chaozhou. But Chanteau, I wanted to go. I wanted to go see the island, and I want to experience because when I was there that last time, I thought Chanteau was a uh, I the best of the three cities, in my opinion, uh, especially for food. <clears throat> so we I specifically that was our destination. And this is the old town Chanteau. Now, it doesn't look like much. It's early in the morning. So a lot of the shops are, haven't been opened yet. Uh, but you can see the buildings here are incredibly ornate. This whole area is still being redone. They they the whole area is being, you know, touched up you know new paint all in the clean uh every all the facades are being clean everything's being cleaned up so a lot of the buildings look alike until you walk around and you see some of the intricate details 
of some of these buildings. Let me show you. So here, like you can see here, I mean, look at the detail in some of these buildings. Because they all kind of look similar, it's really easy to miss it, especially if you're driving through the city. Yeah. Uh, you can see here, <clears throat> we were actually walking underneath one of these eaves. When you're walking underneath, it's nice and shaded and cool, so it doesn't really... Um, doesn't really get to you. But then you walk under these buildings and you don't see the building. So we actually were crossing the street and we looked up and we saw this. And this is indicative of the type of buildings you will see in Old Town Chanteau. And they're just beautiful. Incredible. And this is a great place to take photos. I got some great drone footage. This will be in an upcoming vlog. Adventures in Chanteau, I guess. And all the buildings have, I mean, this one's a very, very beautiful example of it. They're not all this beautiful, but many of them are. And then if you walk like one block off the main road down an alley, if you're just one building off the main road, you will see it, nothing has been updated and it's really old and run down. And, and uh, it has a little bit more of that old character. So Old Town Chateau was... Uh, an interesting place to spend a day. We walked around. We had some got some tea. Uh, God, I'm very disorganized, aren't I? Chanteau is famous for fruit, the Chao Shan fruit. I get it a lot. In fact, I got it over here. So you see this a lot in Chao Shan. Uh, it's just a uh, cut fruit and. Uh, it's delicious. Uh, I eat it all the time here. It's very expensive here in Zhongshan to get it, uh, but it's it's super healthy. And in Shantou, it's everywhere. And of course, they have fruit juice places everywhere. So we just pigged out on fruit. We pigged out on morning tea. Uh, the reason why we had this, um, <laughs> here's a story. The first night, we were going to stay on the island, but we couldn't find accommodations that were satisfying to us. I mean, they had beautiful uh, beaches and everything, but to be honest with you, the island, it, it's a place where you want to go and experience the beach and eat the seafood. And uh, that's not what we were there for. So we drove um, it back into Chaoshan, uh, the center of town, and we stayed at a Howard Johnson's Hot Springs Resort. If you don't know, Howard Johnson's like a, like a road side in or a, a motel back back home but here it was um it was kind of nice it wasn't too bad and we had these this these hot springs and we enjoyed the hot springs the next morning we woke up and we were the only ones in the hotel and we said okay let's go get our breakfast and they brought breakfast up but because we we're the only ones there the food they brought out was pre-made it was a uh, it was a set meal and everything was cold and we we're like how long has this been sitting out and so we didn't eat the breakfast it, it was truly disappointing. I got video of it, everything, and the manager was very accommodating to us. So we uh, searched online, and Mona found this um, this morning tea, uh, Chao Shen morning tea, and so that's what we ate. We uh, in an old, old building, and you know, lots of old people smoking cigarettes all around us. But man, the food was good. That is a shrimp tempura wrapped in a red rice. Uh, uh, can't even call it now. You know what it is. You know what it is. <laughs> it's delicious is what it is. <laughs> so uh, then we checked into the um, Chanteau International Hotel for the second night, which was built in 1988. So it's an older hotel, but man, was this a first class hotel. You, a lot of times namesake hotels such as the Zhongshan International here, or even the Zhongshan Hot Springs Resort, are very old and they don't keep up. They were built 20, 30 years ago, and they're not keeping up you know, with modern amenities and everything. This was not the case. The Chateau International was an incredible hotel, very, very luxurious, and not too expensive. I think I paid like uh, 500 renminbi for the night here, which is $75 around there. I don't know. And we we were upgraded to a suite. You know, we, we just pigged out on food. We went to, for a walk in the neighborhood. We went to this very famous uh, beef hot pot place because Chanteau is famous for beef hot pot. 
We had it a lot, actually. <laughs> and uh, we had some beef hot pot. Uh, this is uh, everywhere. We have this in my town in Zhongshan, but this is the original one. And we just paid out on beef hot pot, man. Oh, good stuff. The next morning, we woke up and we drove down the coast towards Shanwei. And uh, we stayed in Shanwei for a night. Let's see if I've got a photo. Is this it? Yeah, this is the hotel we stayed at. This is the Clear Lake Hotel. And about the same price. Very nice, very luxurious. This is the view in the morning. Shantou, uh, uh, not Shan, uh, Chaoshan is a city that, not Chaoshan, I'm sorry, Shanwei <laughs> is a city I've been to a few times, and I absolutely love the city. It's one of my favorite cities in Guangdong. Shanwei is right on the coast. It's surrounded by, it's got all these river inlets and there's a, like a lake inlet as well. Uh, it's a fishing town. So if you like seafood, this is the place to go. Um, this is the view from the room. This is like um, the little harbor inlet here. And we, this is a kind of an athletic uh, park. And we went for a walk in the evening after we had eaten uh, Oyster World and had some pretty good oysters. I, I'm not a big fan of oysters and seafood, but man, this one, this one got to me. I really enjoyed it a lot. So it, it might have changed my mind on oysters. So we drove through um, along the coast off the main highway, just through some villages and just checking things out and looking around. And we ended up staying in, in Shanwei for the night. Nice road trip. Great road trip, actually. We really had a good time. Let's take some uh, some comments here. Let's see here. Mooncake is too sweet for me. Yeah, well, you have the the sweet mooncake, and you also can get um, you know some savory mooncake. Uh, there's some there's ones that have meat in it and stuff. Hmm. They they make them all different ways. I mean, but they're they're too filling for me. A little too dry. It's been raining cats. The dogs <laughs> here since last night. Everywhere flooded now. Dave, where are you at? Where are you at, Dave? Where is it? Yeah. <clears throat> it's that season. It's rainy season. You know, we have scattered showers every day here in Zhongshan and Guangdong. It rained a lot on us during the trip. Oh, it's good coffee. All right, so the title of this live stream is called Stories and the People That Tell Them. And the reason why is because I went here. So this is My China Story, the third international short video competition. This is my first time attending this competition. The, the conference was held in my city, in my backyard at the Zhongshan Hot Springs Resort. And I was very proud of that. And uh, the video that I was associated with won first prize. And uh, it was uh, quite an honor to go up there and receive the prize. Um, so you can see there the, the woman next to me, her name is Joan. She was the producer of the video. And uh, it, was a, it was quite an honor to go up there and accept this prize with her. So yeah. More coming out. The best thing that happened as a result of this uh, this festival or this uh, conference was the people that I got to meet. Uh, I got to meet vloggers and media types and uh, uh, independent journalists from all around China. And it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. It opened my eyes to the fact that there are so many people producing such incredible content here in this country about a variety of topics, but it's all positive. It's all wonderfully positive people with uh, incredible stories, telling little tiny stories. That was the theme of, of the entire conference. And I met some of the greatest people I've ever met. I, I got interviewed a ton, but uh, for example, I'll give you this one here. So this beautiful family here, their channel is called uh, living Asia, and they are from Utah, and their little girls both speak Chinese. They're raising their little girl. I think they're in 
Qingdao, if I can recall, and just an incredibly loving family. Um, and that little girl on the left was uh, the 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 little girl on the right, uh, Winnie. She's she was a little shy, you know, but. Uh, Man, when she came out of her shell, especially when she had food in front of her, she just opened up, right? And the other girl, Emery, she was uh, uh, quite the ham. She knew how, when she was on camera. <laughs> but not only that, before I even met her, she came up to me in the conference while we were just sitting there, and she drew a picture of me. Look at this picture. She actually drew a couple pictures <laughs> of me giving my speech. She was this biggest sweetheart and really the star of the show for the whole uh, couple of days that we were there. I and uh, I'll, I'll never uh, I'll never forget her. She's she's a uh, I she drew actually a picture. I don't have it with me. It's in my car, but she drew an actual picture that I could keep of me giving my speech about uh, storytelling. And I met some other people. Like this is uh, this is Josh from China Matters, who. Uh, I think this guy was one of the most amazing guys I've ever met in China. Uh, he's from Mongolia. He was raised in England, and he's lived the last 10 years or so in China. So he really is a man of three different cultures. And when you talk to him, he's got a very thick British accent. And so it's uh, it's almost like you're talking to an Asian uh, uh, Richard Attenborough. <laughs> because when he interviewed me, his interview style was extremely relaxing and first-class uh, I, I felt uh, privileged to to be there with him. I mean, you can see the interview was happening in this beautiful setting and the way he framed questions and everything. I've never met an interviewer who who was as talented as him. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, I met this guy. Uh, <laughs> this guy's name's Tommy. He's He's an American. He's actually from Orange County, just like me in, in Southern California. And he does Douyin videos from Hainan. And his Chinese is great, but also his thing is Hainanese. And so he convinced me to do a TikTok video with him or a Douyin video with him where he is going to try and teach a, a foreigner some Hainanese. And so he yeah, I it was all scripted. It took like two minutes to film it, but I knew exactly what was going on. And I had to act as if like, oh yeah, I, I don't know what he's saying. And yeah, it was really good. So he taught me how to say, basically, I love you in Hainanese, which is Wailu. And, uh, but he, in the, in the video, he started like, trying to trick me and saying, oh, this is how you say hello. This is how you say ni hao. So <laughs> it's a, it was a wonderful, it was the first time I've ever done any kind of TikTok or Douyin short. And I was shocked because not his, his uh, personality is, he's just a very, uh, wacky guy, if you could say. He was a really, really cool guy. And he, when he pitched this to me, he's like, he just came up with this idea for the day, filmed it in two minutes, and 30 minutes later was out on Douyin and, and ranking. It was really impressive the to see the workflow of some of these guys. And so I learned a lot from him. Really, really neat guy. <clears throat> I met this guy. Uh, this gentleman's from New Zealand. His name is... Um, Adam or Alex, God, it's see. This is the problem with live shows, you know. You <laughs> you're on the spot. You need to answer a question. Um, hold on, Andy, <laughs> Adam, Alex, Andy, Andy, uh, Andy. His uh, Chinese is a uh, YouTube channel is uh, Andy Shanghai Life. And uh, I got to chat with him. We had dinner, uh, sat at the same table, and he was a really, really cool guy. He's been in China a long time, and he makes all kinds of videos. His Chinese is fantastic. All of these guys have incredible Chinese uh, language ability, and I felt like a child because I'm still learning. I'm still taking my classes, and but I, I learned a lot from them, and I got to practice a lot, but uh, I can see being around these guys for such a long time that I have a long way to go. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know this guy, this is Ricardo. He's he's a local here in Zhongshan. Not a, you know, he's been here about six years, and he wrote the song of uh, uh, my uh, uh, Zhongshan or my Zhongshan, uh, which is becoming kind of the theme song for the city here. The incredible music video. If you have my Facebook page, I believe I linked it to the Facebook page. But uh, he's a Grammy award-winning musician from Brazil, and his song. He said he wrote it in thirty minutes. And they recorded it with like drone shots and everything from all around the city. It is a first class 
uh, production of what he did. And he actually sang the song at the award ceremony. Um, you all know this guy. This is Raz from My China. Uh, he was an uh, incredibly <laughs> gracious uh, host. Very, very uh, personable, this guy. Uh, he has such a, a, a wonderful little charisma about him. That's why he's so popular. Everyone knows him. He's uh, all over Chinese uh, social media, and you can see him on Why China. And Raz that night, I think he won three awards. And so we're like saying, dude, you're going to be able to build a house with all these block awards you got. So it was a great time to meet him as well. I was uh, truly blessed. The day after, oh, and, uh, oh, no, not that one. Okay. <laughs> Many photos. Oh, I got to close all them out. Computer's going to go crazy. All right. Let's see here. Susan says, you haven't. Yeah, I got lots of food porn. Wait till you see uh, the food I got coming up soon. <laughs> uh, they are all YouTubers. Which platforms are they using? They are, they all. The thing is, everyone who's on YouTube is also on Chinese platforms as well. Billy Billy Kai Shuo, uh, Douyin, and uh, uh, so they're everywhere. So you can find all these guys on YouTube as well. And we did a lot of filming over the course of three days, and so they're going to see a lot of content about Zhongshan and my city coming up. And yes, these people, Susan, these people are very very talented. Orale. <laughs> yeah, Andy, you know him, Susan. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, God, my my WeChat just just populated so many new contacts from this uh, from this conference. It was great. The next day, because the award ceremony was very long and went into about ten thirty. Man, we were exhausted from a long day of conferences and meetings and things and interviews and creating videos because everyone was was busy doing lots of different things all around the resort. Uh, the next day, we woke up early and went for a tour of Zhongshan. And I've got a vlog coming out about this. All the things you can do in Zhongshan in one day. <laughs> uh, the first place we went to was the bridge. You've seen my bridge video. And so I was very proud to go out there and and kind of show it off. Uh, this is the Zhongshan side of the of the Shenzhen Zhongshan Link. The this is the smaller of the two. The the big one, the tallest one in the world, is um, about not quite twenty kilometers out to sea. Uh, but everyone seemed to be very impressed with this one. And after that, we went to lunch at the, this restaurant uh, in Nanlong. It was low tide at the time, so this way you see a little bit of money. But this, you want to see some seafood? I'll show you some seafood here. So that's the restaurant we all went to. That was actually really good. Now, again, anyone who knows me knows that I'm not the biggest seafood fan in the world. But, uh, you know, I had my share of this stuff. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, this is later. This is at uh, Shichi Lao, which I've done a video on. Some more food porn for you. We we ate a ton, and I think the food was really the the uh, the star of the show for <laughs> for uh, all the visitors here in town. Lots and lots and lots of seafood, but man, everyone ate. This is the pigeon, of course. Shichi pigeon. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also uh, went to the Sun Yat Sen. Uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen's hometown is Zhongshan. That's why it's named Zhongshan. And they have his old house, which is like a national historic uh, park now and museum. And I've talked about this. I made videos a long time, about, long time ago about it. I really should go back and make an updated video because the, the museum there is first class. And the surrounding area is like a cultural uh, uh, village. Uh, it's it's fascinating place to go. I really need to go back and do it again. And then we went to John's Garden after that. God, my photos are just a mess. Where are we? Okay. Then we went to John's Garden. John's Garden is a beautiful garden 
here in Zhongshan. I recently did, Mona and I went there. We did a video. You can see it on my show. Uh, there was nobody there. Today, there was lots of people there. And they had, uh, this is a Szechuan taste changing um, uh, dancer. Uh, they also had the archers. Um, these guys were really, really cool. And afterwards, they they uh, had us do some archery, which was a lot of fun. John's Garden is a beautiful place to spend a couple of days or a couple of hours and relax, walk around, learn some of the culture, especially the architecture. Uh, and uh, it's just a wonderful place to relax here in town. Uh, hot, hot day for sure. Uh, that's another thing people commented on was just how hot it was. Too hot, really. And to change uh, change our shirts multiple times. And, of course, after that, we went and sat in the hot springs because uh, Zhongshan is famous for hot springs. We've got a bunch of them. And uh, Zhongshan Hot Springs Resort, although the resort itself is is rather old, it's almost it's – over. I think it's over 30 years old – uh, it, the gardens are beautiful, and then the hot springs themselves are not natural hot springs. They're man-made, but it's one of the most beautiful swimming pools in the city. A uh, great place to spend. You can spend a whole day there and eat and relax, take a nap, sit in hot springs, go for a swim. And um, we had a lot of fun. Uh, after this tour of Zhongshan, we, we just kind of relaxed in the hot springs. One more thing, and then uh, we'll get to the news. I'm not going to stream too long. I always say that, right? <laughs> because I actually, even though today's a holiday, I have work to do, guys. I have a lot of work to do. So the term is starting for me very soon. So I got some lesson planning to do. Okay, so let's talk about Mutech Burger. If you saw the burger, um, most recent uh, hamburger hunt, you saw Mutech Burger. This is in the center of town. Burger's pretty good. They have a new... Um, challenge called the mutech burger challenge finish the t-rex double plus burger six patties with fries and a coke in three minutes and you get it for free that is six patties with cheese tomato bacon onion sauce and onion rings and it's uh 99 renminbi so it's about a, it's about 100 rmb or if you can eat it in three minutes, you get it for free. I don't even think I can eat it. I mean, this thing is, look at the size of this thing. Now, the owner, the owner said that he had one challenger who tried to do it, couldn't quite do it. But, I mean, that'll feed a family of four. <laughs> I think it's so big. <laughs> but uh, it, does, it does make me uh, a little hungry. <laughs> So if you're in Zhongshan and you want to check out Mutech Burgers uh, T-Rex Burger Challenge, it's 99 RMB for six patty uh, bacon cheeseburger with onion rings, fries, and a soda. Uh, if you can eat it in three minutes, you get it for free. <laughs> ah, three minutes to eat it. I, I, I think that's impossible. I really do. <laughs> oh, man. Billy says, without fries, I can do it. Are you sure, bud? <laughs> Did you see the size of this thing? Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Can you eat that in three minutes? <laughs> I'm not, I don't, I don't think the fries are included. I think I think it, it comes with fries and a soda, but I think if you can eat the burger in three minutes, you get it for free. I, I think that's what it is. But the with the onion rings on top and six patties, I'd like to see you try. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> All right, let's go to the news. We can talk about anything tonight, you know, we can, uh, or today, excuse me. We can talk about um, Mid Autumn Festival, what you're doing. We can talk about any recent vlogs that you've seen, any questions that you have. We can talk about Evergrade or Evergrande. That seems to be in the news a lot right now. Uh, my opinion on Evergrande is that, um, yeah, it's going to hurt. Whatever end up, whatever ends up happening, the market will find equilibrium. It's going to hurt for a lot of people, but I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be okay in the end. Uh, it, it will sting, uh, but will it have a ripple effect on the economy? It might have some, but one thing I have learned in my time here is that the Chinese economy is 
so that is so robust. And even though real estate represents a huge portion of the economy here, uh, people don't realize just how big it really is. So a company like Evergrande and all of its um, contractors and everything, it, it'll, it'll hurt for a lot of people, but I think in the end it'll be just fine. I mean, um, there's so many other sectors of the economy that are just rocking and rolling. That's my 10,000 feet uh, assessment of it. Okay. So let's talk about this. This is the, uh, what do you call it? The Guangdong 21st Century Maritime Silk Road International Expo. That's a mouthful. That is happening this weekend in Guangzhou. I hope to attend. Uh, I haven't been to this one. If you don't know what this is, this is an expo that uh, is, uh, it says here, an international culture and tourism show. Uh it's over 10,000 square meters from 51 countries and regions. And they show off uh, like things like this, a robot. This is from last year. This is the robot making Cantonese style clay pot rice. They, they, so a lot of new technology, a lot of AI stuff coming out, but it's also tourism. So um, uh, it's domestic tourism and international tourism. It's just a really interesting expo. And I hope to attend this weekend in Guangzhou. So be on the lookout for that. It should be coming up on my channel in the next couple of weeks. Let's walk into the International Health Station in Guangzhou. So the, the International Health Station, China's first giant quarantine station, will be put to use. This is, I think it's 5,000, 5,000, uh, yeah, 5,000 rooms. So uh, when you come into through Guangzhou, you will be required to go into quarantine. And that's what this place is. Uh, in late September, so very, very soon. Construction of the first phase of the station has been completed, and the first batch of 184 medical staff started working on the station on Friday. 250, that's the airport, but 250,000 square meter station with 5,074 rooms is China's first international health station to replace quarantine hotels, which are hit and miss. A lot of people don't like the quarantine hotels. Some people, depends on which one you, you want to pay for. So um, now everyone will be going into this centralized area for quarantine. And uh, this is what the interior of it looks like. The rooms themselves, it, it looks like a, I've told, it looks like a military barracks. Uh, everyone has their own little room, which has a bed and a television. And, uh, oh, this is actually a nice one. Let's see here if it play. Okay, so, okay, so a little desk. Bathroom. I don't know. Is it playing audio? I don't know if it's playing audio or not. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It comes with like a little yoga mat. That's kind of cool, actually. What a great idea. All right. Standard little bathroom in a sink. You got to be in here for two weeks. Little mini fridge. Yeah, it looks okay. Doesn't look too bad. Nice TV. These chairs. So this this uh, this furniture. You can see that chair right there. That chair right there. Okay. So this furniture here is ubiquitous everywhere I go. The <laughs> they're they're literally everywhere. You see them in dentist office. You see them in uh, waiting rooms, you know, you see them in people's homes. I actually have a, uh, a old sofa like this in my uh, apartment on the university. So this is, uh, <laughs> uh, that's where that is. And this looks like, uh, okay. Doesn't look too bad, guys. Well, everything is brand new. We'll see what it's like a year or two from now. But, uh, this is the where you will go. Yeah. Oh, we talked about hot dogs, right? This is a cool little hot dog stand that opened up in Guangzhou. I hope to uh, go check this out. Apparently, it's not easy to find, but um, they say that. Yeah, here you go. Look at that. Oh, heart attack in your hand. Look at that. They have a Chipotle one. Mm. Okay. Well, Danny B has a question. Danny B asks, can you please talk about what it takes to be a successful English teacher in China? 
I talked about this before. I think um, the best thing is your attitude. Uh, you know, obviously, you should have training and experience and uh, have a, a a joy of the language itself. It also depends really on who you're going to teach. I teach adults and university, which um, I I don't want to teach children. I don't want to teach ABCs. I want to teach higher level English, and it also permeates other subjects because through English you teach humanities, you teach uh, business, you teach history. Um, so that all of that comes out through language learning, which is why I chose to become a language teacher because I didn't want to be teach one subject like math or or history or or science. It's it's really cool that through language and through teaching language, you end up teaching all these subjects. And that's one of the things I enjoy about being an English teacher. But uh, it's all about attitude, it, especially if you're coming from a foreign country, coming in China, it's your first time, your perception and the law of attraction, what you give out comes right back to you. So um, I think that's the most important thing. Also take your job seriously, put in the work for lesson planning. Most of my time is spent lesson planning. And uh, it for a 90 minute lecture could take 20 hours of work to put together a 90 minute lecture. So it's, uh, it's, you can half ass it and get through your day. But uh, if you want to be a real successful English teacher, you got to know how to teach. You got to know the processes. Um, you have to go, go invest in your training. Um, really take it seriously. A lot of a lot of the people that were here using English teaching as just a way to travel and see China, uh, that's fine. But they weren't, they're all gone for the most part. They've all left. And so the ones that I feel are still in China now are the ones that take the job very, very seriously and are proud to be English teachers. I'm proud. A lot of people like to dismiss, you know, we had this conversation recently. And uh, someone called, oh, you're just an English teacher. And I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? And they said, oh, anyway. And I said, no, 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 you do, <laughs> don't backtrack. A lot of people like to brush you off as saying, oh, you're just, a, you're just a teacher. And that's a very Western way of looking at it and things, unfortunately. Um, when people try to throw that at my feet, I pick it up and wear it as a badge of honor because I think English teaching is awesome. And I, I love the job. It's my favorite thing in the world to do. I like it more than this YouTube channel. I mean, it's why I'm here. So, uh, if you are to be an English teacher or looking at being it, do it for do it for the reasons that you want to teach. You want that intrinsic. Uh, you have that intrinsic motivation to get you into the classroom because financially it doesn't pay a lot. You know, you're not going to get rich teaching English uh, or anything. <laughs> you know, you have to really enjoy it. You'll get rich with other with other things. Cool, Danny. All right, cool. Thanks, man. All right, back to the news. Okay. Just a couple more, guys. I bet you lack a sofa chair in your house. Okay, so I saw this. I want to know what you guys thought about this. Okay. Uh, these are crazy design chairs. That's a standard little chair you might see, right? Look at this thing. I don't know about you, but I think this is freaking ugly. <laughs> but I'm curious about how... It feels to sit in it. It's made of a polyurethane foam, which is quite geometric. And the space between the grass, you can put some books like that. So I, I applaud the uh, the design in this, I guess, but I just think it's severe. Maybe a different color might happen, but I don't know. Do you think you can... Uh, Sleep in that? <laughs> I have to sit in it to find out. Here's another one. If you've ever sat in these chairs, I don't find these chairs to be comfortable at all. So um, these little circle chairs, they're they're never very comfortable. It's like a flower. I don't know if I can get comfortable in that one. But yeah, that was the uh, the crazy one. Hmm. Look at that. I think that is 
design over function, without a doubt. <laughs> Looks like something you might have seen in the 1980s, right? There's something interesting. These little suckers. These are modular. I don't know. <laughs> the height can be adjusted different ways. It reminds me of Qbert. <laughs> Yeah, Bill says, too hard to clean it. Yeah, I agree 100%, man. Yeah. If it's in your house, you probably clean it. But if it's in a public area, they probably don't get cleaned, probably. I already talked about that. Okay. Let's talk about this. There's another little um, design studio. Cool-looking chair, but I can't imagine uh, it being comfortable. But I wanted to show you this one because... This is a design element that I'm starting to see a lot more, especially in people who work from home. So here you have a living room. It looks pretty cool, I guess. It's a standard uh, Chinese apartment, I guess. Uh, nice big sofa, TV, right? A couple of design elements. Okay, but notice where the desk is. The desk is behind the sofa. It's right here, behind the sofa. So what you do is you you create kind of an office living room setup to where you can watch TV and work at the same time. And I'm, this is the setup that I've always had in my, my house because you know, to me, if I'm working here like this and the TV's right there, I can kind of watch the game or, or do whatever while I work, but I'm starting to see it a lot more in interior design, uh, for houses. Kind of an ugly couch, to be honest, but that's okay. But you can see here the, again, you have the center island for the for the kitchen, and it just kind of flows into the dining room. So there's no separate dining room. It just flows into the dining room table, all part of the, I love this. And I think, I think it's a great idea, and I think it should be more common. Okay, last one. Harley Davidson will sell its e-bike at the end of 2021. I've been riding e-bikes in China for years. I love e-bikes um, as far as e electric scooters. And it's great to see that, uh, you know, some of the big manufacturers are starting to come out with e-bikes for, you know, the North American markets and stuff. Don't worry if you're disappointed that Harley Davidson's first e-bike didn't include an eye-catching vintage model and electric the as Electric notes, Harley's series Serial One brand now plans to sell a highly similar retro bike, the Mosh Tribute, in late fourth quarter. Pre-order it for six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars, you get a Harley Davidson electric bike. Now, I think the white wheels are pretty cool. You know, that's very vintage and all. But six thousand dollars for an I mean, I can go out right now and buy an electric scooter across the street for about $250 with, you know, 60, 70 kilometer range, you know, it'll go 25, 30 kilometers per hour. I think $6,000 for an electric e-bike is way too much. You're buying your, if you, if you want, I mean, there are, <clears throat> this is why e-bikes, don't take off in North America. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not that they're not popular. It's just that they're too expensive. I don't understand why they are so expensive. The same bike I can buy across the street right now for 250 bucks that'll last me three years is selling for something like uh, $1,500 in North America. And you can say, okay, well, you have transport costs and all that stuff. No, I, I think honestly, they're just too expensive. And that's why people buy them here because they're a cheap alternative for transportation. $6,000. No, thank you. <laughs> Stanley says, sleeping on a sofa has been a lifelong dream for me. Growing up poor, we've never had a sofa capable of that. Well, sleeping on a sofa, I, I'm ah, my old back. I don't think I can sleep on sofas anymore. I got a sofa right over here that I have taken a nap on and it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> so I'd rather have a bed, but uh, sofas, 
I, I instead of having a bedroom, living room, office, kitchen, dining room, guest room, bathroom, I'm starting to see all the walls being torn down, and a lot of these elements are becoming multifunctional. So, for example, the sofa is your bed, and and um, the especially here in in Asia, the the bathroom is wide open to the uh, to the the bedrooms. Um, you'll have curtains and stuff that can come down, but you're starting to see these walk-in uh, showers and walk-in bathrooms. So you get out of bed, you just walk into the corner, and that's where your shower is with maybe a little glass partition. Uh, I welcome, It's kind of a throwback to the way things used to be, but it's a very modern twist to it. Of course, you have the open kitchen with living room. They call it the great room concept. That is starting to take off here in Asia, and everything's just – the walls are getting knocked down. Everything's being open. And I'm applaud that. So the the desk or a, a kitchen table, you have a giant kitchen table, one that spans the entire. I'm talking about dining room table, the one that spans the entire room, is also doubling as a workstation. So you'll have laptops and computers set up on one end, and then it'll be uh, outfitted with um, plates and spoons and knives and a dining area on the other end, and it's the same table. So you're starting to see a lot more cross functionality with all the furniture pieces. Uh, I think it's really cool. It's going to open up a lot of new ideas for uh, furniture. Okay. With that being said, uh, I told you it wasn't going to be a long one today. If you have any other questions, let me know. Some videos that are coming out, I'm working on my final one for Hangzhou, the walkabout Hangzhou, where I dive deep into the new Hangzhou hotel. I hope to finish that today. The Gujin one after that, it's been in the can for a couple of weeks. I uh, just haven't gotten to editing it. That'll come out after that. I have a Dongfeng uh, vehicle, an old Dongfeng SUV that I toured. I don't know if you guys want to see it. It's not a very good video. I might just put it out just for the hell of it. <laughs> and uh, I got that one. I've got another hotel video. I've got the My China Story vlog video, which will be a long one, but I'll just have all those people that I showed you in it. Uh, it, was, it includes a tour of Zhongshan. Uh, I've got adventures in Chanteau that we just got done filming for the weekend. Uh, another food video, a couple more China randoms videos coming out as well, as well as uh, coming up this uh, this weekend. I hope to attend the Maritime Twenty uh, First Century Maritime Expo, so that'll be coming up as well. In addition. Uh, Next weekend, not this weekend, but the following weekend is the Shenzhen International Auto Show. I hope to attend. I got another one that I'm I've already started filming. I just need to get back out there and finish it on baseball in China, because Zhongshan is a baseball town, as well as the town of Shashi. Lots and lots of things. I am a busy, busy guy. Uh, I also am I'm planning to do one on horseback riding because here in Zhongshan is one of the oldest. Um, horse brigades in the country of China started by Sun Yat-sen. It's in Nanlong. And in addition, there are equestrian centers all around. So uh, I'll be doing that as well as the Zhongshan Hot Springs Resort. Uh, I filmed a little bit of it, but then I got to go back and film the uh, what they call Villa One, which is basically the presidential villa for when presidents come and stay you know so uh, lots of lots of things coming up on my channel uh i hope that uh, you guys stick around when will they release the zeker one wonder how good the production version is going to be the I, I drove the pre-production one which is ex essentially the production one it's they but it they, they were like one month away from the actual production models i think they're on sale you can pre-order them now but i think they're actually sold out for the year Check what, check it out. They should be out either this week or next month. Within the next five, four, five weeks, the Zeker one will be out in the public. That's their plan. So um, be on the lookout for the Zekers. They are a first-class vehicle. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to take off because i got work to do. So thank you for everything, and we'll see you in the next one. Be safe, guys.